Hi, I'm Brian Welch. I'm the publisher of Mother Earth News, and I'm here at the Mother Earth News Fair in Lawrence, Kansas in 2013 with my good friend and an inspiring leader, Woody Tash. Morning, Woody. The good friend part is true. Yes, well, I think the inspiring leader part is true as well. For those of you who don't know, uh, Woody's been a pioneer in the movement to create new financial ways of supporting things like local agriculture, sustainable agriculture, and conscientious business for a couple of decades. And his latest venture is called Slow Money, which provides us with various ways of investing in realistic, sustainable, conscientious farming practices and farming enterprises. Where did the idea to start Slow Money come from? How did you, I mean, it's a brand new notion uh, where, did you, where did you get the idea? I'm, and te I'm tempted to say it's an ancient notion. It's just brand new to, to us. But what do you mean, mean by that? Meaning, well, ancient maybe is too, too funny of a word. Certainly an old-fashioned idea. Yeah. I mean, the idea that you would invest in things that you understand near where you live, I mean, it doesn't seem that far-fetched, right. except to modern investors. So Maybe more rational than modern investing in some ways. Might be just a little more commonsensical. Yeah. Um, so the idea uh, just evolved. Uh, uh, over the last couple of decades of work in social investing and philanthropy and uh, angel investing. Um, probably the most immediate uh, inspiration was slow food, of course, which is where the slow came from. Uh, I'd been working on patient capital for a while before that, talking about uh, how we as investors extend our time horizons and relax our urgent need to take as much money as possible out of things as quickly as possible, called making money and high rates of return. Right. So the idea of patience and patient capital had been kind of knocking around for a while. But when I met the slow food people in 2000 in Italy, it just clicked with me the minute I met them. I said, oh my God, patient capital, no, it's actually supposed to be slow money. Yeah. And something is different when you put the word slow next to the word money. Um, and we're still enjoying that different thing um, as our network evolves. And yeah. Your previous enterprise was the investor circle. It was. Invest Circle, still going. Uh, it's the, actually one of the oldest angel networks in the country. It's a few hundred high net worth people from across the country. It started in 1992, so it's pretty early. So for people too. who aren't investors or aren't in the investing world, what's an angel? Good, good, good question. And then you're going to have to ask me what an earthworm angel is. Okay, I will. Next. Okay, so an angel investor is uh, a, high net, a sophisticated person by IRS guidelines. This means a person who has significant wealth and who has... Um, let's say, experience investing in early stage companies. Sure. And so the angel, the earthworm angel then must and be an angel who invests in the slow money. That movement. is correct. Ah. You are very, you are very good. <laughs> um, so yeah, our little, our little name earthworm angel is kind of a funny little name for uh, in the slow money activities, which we'll talk about however you lead me to talk about them. Uh, we have all kinds of people. We have very high net worth people and we have just regular folks and people with a few thousand bucks and people with $25 and people who just want to click on a few things and don't want to, don't have any money to put in right away. So we have a little of everybody. Um, and gradually we've realized it's important to create a, a way for the angel investors, the, the high net worth experienced people to find a way to, to get together, connect with one another and uh, collaborate on some investing activities. So that's a loose title, Earthworm Angels, for that, for that group. But it is unusual to tie a group of those investors together to do this kind of investing because they're used to doing high tech and uh, you know, high growth things. Sure. So you're creating networks of both investors. They must be creating networks of food producers, too, so that you're able to connect those investors to meaningful places where they can put some money. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, the simplest way to just think about it is we are merely, um, let's say, connecting small food entrepreneurs, and there's a bunch, and we can talk about the categories of them, with various categories of investors. And we're doing that both um, physically by bringing people together, both regionally and nationally, I meaning literally at meetings, um, yep. large and small. And that's, that's the key to what we're doing, actually. We really believe, again, a little bit counterintuitive for the modern investor who's used to clicking, like investing in China at 2 a.m. in the morning, like the commercial says. Like, look, I just invested in something in China. Um, <laughs> Um, we're kind of doing the opposite. It's like, no, we, like, we want to spend the time to get to know one another and we want local knowledge to be leading the investment. So that means actually bringing people together in small groups around the country um, and then adding to that the power of other forms of connectivity when we can. But to your point, there's a lot of different kind of uh, vectors of those networks. Um, 
um, and we are um, loosely trying to support and manage them. So let's start with the investors. Can you describe for me a couple of typical investors and why they invested, where they came from, and what their goals are? Sure. Uh, uh, so uh, Marco Vangelisti, I'll give names. Um, hopefully I won't embarrass them too much. Marco Vangelisti is a, kind of an early refugee from finance, meaning Oh, he might be 50 years old. Actually, I'm very bad at people's ages, but let's say he's around 50. Uh, had been in finance for 15 or 20 years. Um, got out. And he speaks about this publicly, so I don't think he'd mind me saying, bastardizing uh, his story. Um, and one of his specific responsibilities was uh, managing foundation investment portfolios for a major money manager, major global money manager. What's a foundation investment portfolio? What does that mean? So you have, let's say, the XYZ Foundation. Oh, so these are big nonprofits. These are these are big pots of portfolios. money, right? Okay. So so if like take the Gates Foundation, if, if you know a big one would have many many billions of dollars of assets. Where is that money? It's sitting in the stock market. But mostly nonprofits that have some sort of mission-driven orientation. Yeah, well, the, it's a typical private foundation will have their money invested in whatever. Right. That's one and of the big questions. Give it away to and then the income from causes. those investments or the capital gains they take right. and they give it away as grants. Okay. So that's how, that's how a foundation works. Right. So uh, Marco was working for a major uh, institutional money manager who had a lot of foundation clients. And uh, he, he found himself in the position, of, he, he realized that, hey, we're investing these assets for these charitable entities in all kinds of things that are counter to their mission. Meaning like you could have an environmental grant maker that's invested in like a palm oil plantation. Right, sure. And they don't even know. The foundation people right. don't even know. It's right. just all the money guys are doing that, and then they're giving the money to the grant makers, and the grant makers are giving the grants away, and the two left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. So that, by the way, um, you, you know this, Brian, but I was a foundation treasurer for most of the 90s, and that was what kind of really impelled me into a lot of this work because of that very issue. And we were um, an environmental grant maker and a sustainable ag grant maker, and yet our assets were invested in some of the big companies that our grantees were fighting. Right. And gradually, the board came to the whole board came to that realization, which is still very radical in American philanthropy. Said, "Wait a minute, we should not have our assets invested in those companies if we're giving grants to the community groups that are fighting with those companies." Right. That does seem pretty commonsensical, and it's a really intractable problem because the the fiduciary mindset, the financial sophisticated mindset that we all have as investors in the 20th and 21st century is it's our obligation to make as much money as we can as quickly as possible, as quickly as possible because that's feeding the pump of uh, economic growth and priming the pump and whatnot. Right. And then if we make enough, then we get to kind of give it away and try to fix things. So anyhow, that's a long background story, but Mark- Almost as though we gain consciousness only if we make enough money first. That would be a skeptical, a skeptic's uh, view of the situation. <laughs> yes, right, yeah. So, um, well, since you put it that way, I would just say it's one of the horrible problems. Uh, having been on the edges of, um, well, how would you put it, the 1%, if we want to say that, for my whole career, it is absolutely a fact. Um, I have no empirical data to support this, but lots of, lots of um, anecdotal data. Uh, it is absolutely a fact that, that when, when that much wealth surrounds a person, it does change their consciousness. I know that's kind of an obvious thing to say, but you've talked about awareness coming with great wealth. Absolutely. And I think it's kind of, the, it's harder. It's, it's almost harder. It's the like opposite, a, sure. It's not a matter of awareness. It's just a matter of like the gravitational force, the, the energy of that much money that you have to think about all the time and where is it going and what are you doing with it. And, and so what do we do? We give it to other people who are, who are, let's say, have more expertise than we do. Yeah. This is at all levels, this plays out. If it's an institution, you hire money managers who know way more than the people on the board of the institution. Yep. But we're always giving it to others yep. to invest in sophisticated things somewhere. We don't right. really know where it is. Right. And it turns out with derivatives and all the rest, we really don't know where it is. Really? And we really don't know what it's doing. Right. And the we is every single person, at, no matter how high up, but all the way down through the middle levels of everything. And we're all sort of reeling from that. So anyhow, coming back to Marco, um, uh, Marco realized he didn't want to do that anymore. And once he had the realization, and he started talking to a few of the foundation clients of the firm, he realized that either he had to stop talking to them that way, or he had to go do something else, because he was talking outside of the lines of the system. He was supposed to be making money for them, right. so they could give money away, not questioning the whole thing. So, right. so that's a long way of getting around. He left, and he's doing some slow money deals in San Francisco now, um, investing in little chicken farms and corner markets and tell us and, about and a couple of those what does a slow money deal look like uh, you know they one of them they all made a field trip to a organic egg producer 
between Sacramento and San Francisco and I sat in the kitchen and uh, I forget the amount of money that was involved in that one. I think it was about forty thousand dollars. So this is a farmer. This is somebody who was this, this who is a farmer who, who is expanding a little eggs. bit their their uh, egg, their their chicken and egg business, and they needed forty thousand dollars for whatever at that moment. And t I think it was nine individuals collectively gave the forty thousand dollars. So so at that level, it's almost like micro lending for each person. In other words, each person put in a few thousand dollars. And is it a loan? It's a loan, low interest loan. Are they all loans? Is all slow the money right the now loans? Uh, there's no one, we don't um, prescribe any one kind of investment, but, the, but um, as a matter of practicality, the vast majority are low interest loans. Very simple promissory notes. Because when you're doing things at that level where it's just you and a small food producer and a couple of people, the simplest thing you can do is, a, is a, just a direct promise. So these people needed another big coop so they could produce Something more like eggs Correct. because they had restaurants in San Francisco who wanted Correct. more of their organic eggs. Correct. But they couldn't, they couldn't go to a conventional bank to get an affordable loan to create the coop because yeah. we all know agriculture has relatively thin margins and big capital uh, investments at the front end. And so yep. your supporters, the slow money investors, mm -hmm. went in, had a cup of coffee in the kitchen with the farmers, said, yeah, mm -hmm. we can come up with $40,000 so yep. you can build the coop, so you can expand your business, you exactly. can pay us back at a reasonable rate. So you say low interest. Yeah. What is low interest in slow uh, money? That was probably a 3 or 4% interest okay. and no collateral. In other words, the investors are taking a high risk for a low return. Yep which is also not what we were all taught to do in business school. No, <laughs> you know, that's, so, I recall so, it being the opposite. It, so. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I actually, I like saying it that way because it just seems so crazy. Um, and it makes people, it's like, what are you doing? Um, <laughs> um, you know, it's high risk, low return instead of high risk, high return. Um, well, it's, it, it, it's high risk in terms of, there's no collateralization. It's an no. unsecured loan. Mm -hmm. But track record for micro lending around the world has shown that it's not really high risk, even so, though it's unsecured. The whole conversation to have risky compared to what, which is, right. you know, we could have talk for hours about that. I just say it to be, to catch people's attention and, and, uh, and kind of be a wise guy. Right. But, These farmers usually repay their loans, just like the small, very small scale entrepreneurs in Bangladesh usually right. repay their, right. I mean, they more often repay their loans than typical business people in the Western world do. Right, but, I, but before you even go down that rabbit hole, there's the other rabbit hole called Wall Street, and anybody who has spent a lot of time investing in the stock market, you know, you'd have, most people are just kind of lost in the world of computer algorithms and big institutional sure. trades. I mean, the small sure. investor on Wall Street, right never comes out ahead really when you calculate everything and all the long-term costs and fees and right. everything else. So the, the, the situation in Wall Street, I, th I think any, a common sense view of it would be it's pretty risky <laughs> um, when entire investment banks can go under and we're, we're, not, we're never out of all that. None of that stuff went away. There's just huge amount of risk in the global financial situation sure. now. So to take a little of your money out of that and take this kind of risk doesn't seem that crazy to, thus, to those of us who are doing it. Well, it doesn't seem crazy for a number of reasons. One of them is the relative risk factor, which I agree with you, it is possibly lower in slow money than it is in the conventional markets. But also, you know, if you do invest in Wall Street, if you invest in almost any conventional uh, uh, vehicle of any kind, a significant amount of your money has been soaked up in fees, it's being soaked up by Wall Street itself, this yeah. enormous, incredibly wealthy institution mm -hmm. that makes money effectively just for moving our money around, right? Um, you know, one of my favorite movies I don't talk about much is Trading Places. Yeah. There's that great scene in there where they're... Where Dan Aykroyd's explaining to Eddie Murphy what's right. actually going on. Yeah, and it's like some people want to buy orange juice and some people want to sell orange juice and some people think the price of gold is going to go up. And other people think the price of gold is going to go down, and we don't care. We don't because care because whatever they do, we make money. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And we're in that kind of a culture where it is a trading culture. You know, the traders, yes, the right. people who are kind of managing the toll booths, they collect a lot. But if know. I put ten thousand dollars of my money into a loan through slow money, no fees, no Z fees, zero fees. So ten thousand so dollars. Then you got to ask money. me how we're doing slow money. That's a different question. But how we are doing? That's not, we don't got such a great business model for that part. Uh, but we're committed to that. I mean, we don't want to be a fiduciary. We, this this is about helping people connect directly to one another and doing business together with as little intermediation as possible. And for us, that means no fees. So, so all ten thousand dollars of my money is now because alone in the hands of a farmer who's creating organic free range eggs. Correct. And I would like to add one thing to that story, um, just because we started with a pretty sophisticated guy, Marco who had a pretty sophisticated financial background. I want everybody to know the other, if there were 10 people in that particular loan,
probably eight of them were not sophisticated like Marco in terms of experience. They were just yeah. friends and neighbors that he met through the Slow Money Network. And so it's important for people to hear that there are some sophisticated financial types in and around this, but there's also just a lot of um, what I've come to call just plain regular folks who want to know where their money's going and where their food comes from, but and, and are, are learning by doing this. Yeah. How are you supporting Slow Money? How do you guys get paid? Um, we're uh, kind of the old-fashioned way. We raise money. You, know, you ask we're, people to we support ask people. what you so, do. So we've been fortunate so far. We've had uh, a few thousand people, actually, at all levels, but really a few hundred, and then in there a few dozen, just the way you would expect, who have been providing. We've raised uh, about $3.5 million in our first four years, which supports we have a team of seven people. and. Um, I'm confident that long term, if we keep creating value for all of these different folks doing this, we will figure out various ways to um, have some revenue streams that will get us out of the completely, you know, the donation thing. But let me say but, that but you have very good people, also. That you know, you you describe it all as though it might be somehow a sort of uh, a, a hook or crook or or uh, offhand enterprise. You have a team of seven highly qualified, very professional, oh, highly intelligent, that. and very rigorous people working for you get involved yep. with Slow Money. You're working yep. with a very good team. Well, thank you for saying that. Um, we're doing our best. Yeah. Um, favorite project? Something that you guys... Oh, uh, I, let me give you one other example. You asked for Please. a couple of examples. Yes, I gave you one. Um, so another type of investor. Um, is kind of an, an example of, uh, I'd say, a, a typical angel investor in a way. I don't know if there is such a thing as a typical angel investor. Actually, she's a good crossover. She'd be a perfect example of an earthworm angel. Uh -huh. <laughs> Meaning, someone who has enough money to do a few private deals here and there, someone who has enough money to do above average levels of philanthropy, but doesn't wake up every morning thinking of herself as a money person, right. and um, uh, period. Right. Didn't come out of finance or anything. Yeah. Uh, been involved in the land trust moves, helped start a land trust earlier in her life where she was living in upstate New York and you know just kind of cares about this stuff and finds yeah. ways to help. And um, her name is Leslie Barkley. She happens to be on my board, um, so I know her quite well. And uh, she uh, had a particular interest in a project in Austin, Texas called Coyote Creek. So I'm giving you an example of another transaction. Yes. So Coyote Creek is an organic um, uh, feed. Uh, business about 20 miles from Austin started as a chicken opera organic chicken operation um, a beautiful guy named Jerry Cunningham uh, who unfortunately passed away recently uh, big loss um, really understood that it, that his business was the soil really even though ostensibly the business was the stuff he was selling that came off the top but he was raising chickens and, and pasturing the chickens and paying attention to the microbes in the soil that were creating the pasture for the chickens. And um, guess what? He had great eggs. <laughs> and uh, and um, the people at Whole Foods, because of where he was, noticed what he was doing. And there's some story there that I don't even know. I think they were the first pasture egg suppliers to Whole Foods or something. It was very small scale, but because yeah. where they were. And um, um, because of all that, uh, and because he started creating organic um, feed for his chickens to supplement the pasture because there was no place to buy organic feed in Texas. Right. right. Guess what? Suddenly had 200 other small um, organic um, uh, egg producers and, and ch uh, chicken operations in Texas wanting to buy his feed. So he grew a few million dollar feed business. Mm. It's a beautiful little business helping a couple of hundred uh, farm families in the area. And now he's actually been asked to replicate it in Georgia. And so they're now looking for a site in Georgia because it turns out in the southeast of the United States, basically there are no small-scale providers of organic feed. Yeah, in much of the country in there must, are. In much of the country. There are a yeah. few more in a few other places, but it was a real paucity there. So there's another kind of a business. Um, so and you all need them alone? The slow money. So in, in uh, Austin, I think they raised about $250,000. I can't tell you from the number of people. I don't remember that. But it's people like Leslie, you know, Angel, this is more of an angel deal because mm -hmm. it was a little bit more money. To do what? Uh, in that case, it was just to kind of finish the business, finish uh, building out the feed business in Texas. Yeah. And that, but now they were, they've done another raise um, and to, to uh, develop their, their uh, mill in Georgia. Fantastic. And, and a business like that is interesting because it's an infrastructure business. So that business immediately helps a couple of hundred other businesses. You know, the ripple effect is quite, yeah. quite dramatic. Yeah. Very exciting. So, well, we really admire what you do, and we thank you for it, and thanks for joining us here today.
Thanks for your time. Love being with you. I'm Brian Welch at the Mother Earth News Fair with Woody Tash, and we thank you all for listening in.